Welcome to the Indie Nola First Podcast. Thank you so much for joining us today. Our prayer is that this message will inspire you, encourage you, and launch you into life-changing action. Praise God for his blood. We've been singing a lot about the blood lately. Been preaching about the blood too. And uh, it's something that, uh, you know, the, the further you get into it when you're doing these studies, at least for me anyway, it, 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 it just, there's no end to it. It just goes deeper and deeper. And I say that all the time about the Word of God, but it's just the truth. Uh, there's no end to the depth of truth that's in His Word. And it's so important, church, especially as we draw close to uh, His second coming. And I believe we're close. But it's so important that we really just make the Word the centerpiece of our life and read it and listen to it and, and just fill ourselves with His Word, be hyper-focused on Jesus and His Word. You know, Jesus is the Word in the flesh, right? It's one and the same. So it, it's, it's so important that we do that and we... we uh, just fill ourselves with it continually. Well, the year was somewhere around 1660 B.C. The Israelites had become enslaved in the nation of Egypt. Everybody say enslaved Slave. to Egypt. They had lived in peace there since Joseph was placed second in command over all of Egypt. But generations later, the king of Egypt became fearful of God's people. They had grown so numerous, he became increasingly worried that they would rise up and overthrow, even though they hadn't make it, made any indication that they would do so. Exodus 1, 6 through 9 says this, in, the, in time, Joseph and all of his brothers died, ending that entire generation. But their descendants, the Israelites, had many children and grandchildren, in fact, they multiplied so greatly that they became extremely powerful and filled the land. Verse 8, eventually a new came, king came into power in Egypt who knew nothing about Joseph or what he had done. He said to his people, look, the people of Israel now outnumber us and are stronger than we are. So Pharaoh is a term that is used to describe the supreme ruler over Egypt. I just read a scripture where it called him king. Pharaohs were considered gods on earth and mediators between God, the gods, and the people. And these pharaohs believed the hype, okay? They believed themselves to be gods. And isn't it funny how often that happens to career politicians? They start to believe that way. Did I, did I just say that out loud? All right. Sorry. <laughs> anyway, this pharaoh became, or because of his fear, he decides to, to make life difficult for the Israelites. He doesn't like the fact that they're growing, they're prospering, they're becoming stronger than they are, and we're, he's like, this is not good, let's, let's beat them down a little bit. So he put slave masters over them and he oppressed them with forced labor, and the Bible says that the more oppressed they were, the more they multiplied and spread. How many know we serve a God like that, right? The Israelites, when you read in the Old Testament, they are God's people. We are God's people today, right? We're grafted into the vine. We've been adopted as sons and daughters. So there's so many parallels here, and I'm not even going to get to even a smidgen of them, but we're going to talk about some of them today. But the more they multiplied, the more bitter Pharaoh tried to make their lives. He just kept pouring on the, the hardship as much as he could. And you must understand, this, this went on for hundreds of years. This wasn't just a, an all of a sudden thing. Hundreds of years, pharaohs lived and died, and generations of Israelites lived and died. And with each new generation, and with each new pharaoh, things grew worse for the Israelites. And eventually they became completely enslaved to the Egyptians. At one point, pharaoh ordered the midwives to kill every Israelite baby that was a boy. This is how bad it got. Just kill all those babies. Can you believe a society would kill babies? I mean, just let that sink in a little bit. 
When that didn't work because the midwives wouldn't do it, they said to the Pharaoh, they're like, we, we, we can't do that because these, these Hebrew women, these Israelite women, they're, they're so hardy and they're so tough that by the time we hear they're in labor and gonna have a baby, they already have the baby when we get there. So we can't do anything about it. So when that didn't work, he ordered that every male baby born to the Israelites was to be thrown into the Nile River. These were a people, that the Israelites, that were completely enslaved by this time, treated like dirt because the Egyptians feared their numbers as well as their stamina as a people, as well as their strength as a people. Pharaoh feared them. And they became enslaved to Egypt sometime after Joseph's death, and the time gap between that and the great exodus from Egypt was close to 450 years or so. Some Bible experts say that the the real persecution didn't begin until around 220 years after Joseph died. You know, there's speculation in there, but but that's a pretty agreed upon date. And, And it was enough time that the heroism of Joseph, as we just read about, saving the whole nation of Egypt from famine was long forgotten. And you might not know that story, so go back and read it in Genesis. But the persecution lasted at least another 230 years after that in their stay of Egypt. And that's a long time to be persecuted and enslaved. Again, this didn't happen overnight. This was a long process, slowly becoming enslaved. And you know, church, the devil enslaves us that way too. It's a real picture for us today because a lot of times people, uh, Christian people, do not become enslaved and they do not fall to, to being in bondage to something just overnight on a whim. Sometimes, but most of the time, it's because there's been little compromises, little things here, little things there, and they're slowly sucked in. You know, the devil, I don't want to give him any compliments this morning, but he's, he's patient. He just plants little thoughts. He plants little things. He plants little st- stuffs in our lives, you know? He plants it there. And then we're sucked in slowly, and pretty soon we're like, wait a minute, I'm in bondage to this thing. I don't even know how I got here. Some of you might understand what I'm talking about or can relate to that, at least in some level. It was a long time for them to be enslaved and persecuted. And it's interesting that the word Egypt is the word Mitzrayim. Mitzrayim. Everybody say Mitzrayim. Now roll your tongue. Mitzrayim. Good job, Paul. You don't have to do it quite that loud, but that was a good job. Mitzrayim. And that's a Hebrew word. And it's the word that they used for Egypt. Now, according to Jewish scholars, this word stems from a root word, which means to bind, shackle, or imprison, to be bound, to be in bondage or servitude or slavery. So get this in your mind. Egypt, Egypt, the word itself equals bondage or slavery. That's what it meant to the Hebrew people, the Israelites. It's not only a picture of slavery in a metaphoric way because they were enslaved there, it literally means bondage or slavery in the Hebrew language. So these Israelites were enslaved, and most of you know how God saved baby, or saved uh, uh, the Israelite um, baby Moses, right? from being killed by Pharaoh. All Hebrew male children were supposed to be killed at birth, and and, uh, you know, we we just talked about that a minute ago. It sounds familiar to us in in that Herod ordered all male Jewish children two years old and younger to be killed as an attempt to end the life of Jesus. Do you remember that in the New Testament? So there's a picture here, there's a foreshadowing, There's, there's, there's stuff connecting here. And just as Jesus' life was spared and he became savior to all. Moses' life was spared and he became a savior to the Israelites who were enslaved in Egypt. We all know that Moses led the Israelites out of Egypt, right? By God's hand. Let my people go, right? We know. So, Through a series of events, and I'm not going to get into it this morning, events that you can read about yourselves in the book of Exodus chapters 2 through 4, Moses experiences God in an awesome way through a burning bush. And God spoke to him and said in Exodus 3, 7, I have indeed seen the misery of my people in Egypt. I have heard them crying out because of their slave drivers, and I am concerned about their suffering, so I have come down to rescue them from the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them 
up out of that land into a good and spacious land, a land flowing with milk and honey. And then God proceeded to tell Moses that he was going to send him. I'm gonna do this for the Israelite people because I hear their cries. I see their pain. And I'm using you, I'm sending you. And Moses, of course, argues with God about it, but God basically tells him, who are you to question me? I mean, how do, you, how do you like those apples, right? Who are you to question me, God says to him. You're going, and I will be with you as you go. So Moses returns to Egypt and has a little talk with Pharaoh. And he says, let my people go. And most of you know the story. Pharaoh is full of stubborn pride. And, and in that pride, he questions Moses by saying, who is this God that I should have to answer to him? Because remember, he believed the hype. He, he thought he was God himself. I'm God on earth. I'm the mediator between the gods and the people. So who's this God to, to tell me I have to do something? Then God famously sends 10 plagues upon Egypt. And these 10 plagues accomplished several things. They showed that God was God above all their gods and above all humanity as well. The plagues also helped in building up Israel's faith in God's supreme power while simultaneously showing the Israelites his love for them. And these 10 plagues also became the righteous judgments pronounced on the Egyptians and their worship because they worshiped false gods. But another powerful truth behind these plagues is how they showed the stubborn hold that Pharaoh had on these people. These people were in bondage. They had been enslaved for hundreds of years. Their parents were slaves. Their grandparents were slaves. Their great-grandparents were slaves. All they knew was slavery. They had never known or even tasted freedom. So the first plague was a plague of blood that came upon the Egyptians. Moses told Aaron to stretch out his staff over the water of the Nile River and all the water in Egypt turned to blood. There was blood everywhere. And I, I, I mean, I just stopped and as I was reading through this again, I, I tried to picture what that must have been like. Here's this nation that's so blessed, this wealthy, uh, progressive nation of Egypt. It's got this river running through it, right? This Nile River, and that's where it's really teeming with life, and that's where they're pulling their resources from, and they, they are just, they're, just, they're just prosperous, right? And God turns it to blood. In fact, every, all the water turned to blood. Even the blood in their personal water jars and their buckets all turned to blood. The stench had to be unbearable. I mean, maybe not right away, but it didn't take very long for that blood to start reeking. And it would have. It would have. Frogs were the second plague. Frogs represented the gods to the Egyptians. They saw frogs and they were like, ooh, that represents the gods. So the God of Israel absolutely infested the land with frogs. And that had to freak them out. There's gods everywhere. <laughs> and what about when the frogs went away? I mean, I, I don't know what the, I, I guess I, I really don't know what happens. We, we are not really told that in the Bible. What happens to the frogs? Did they all just jump in the bloody Nile River? Did the Nile turn back to water by then and then they jumped in the water? I, I, I don't really know. Did they all just die? Can you imagine that smell? There was frogs everywhere covering everything. Then there was the plague of gnats. They were on the animals and they were on the people and Pharaoh's magicians tried to do the same but could not and once again, the God of, of, of the Israelites showed himself to be all powerful which the magicians readily admitted to Pharaoh. We can't do what this God is doing. Then the plague of flies. What a gross, bloody, dead frog, gnat, fly infested place this was. After the flies came the plague on the livestock. All kinds of Egyptian livestock died while none of the livestock owned by the Israelites was harmed. The Egyptians worshiped bulls. We see that in some of their imagery, right? They believed that the gods revealed themselves through the bulls and that they even enjoyed protection through them, but they witnessed these bulls dying right in front of them. 
And at the exact time Moses said they were going to die. Then the sixth plague happened, the plague of boils. Don't even need to get into that. Ouch. You got blood, you got flies, you got gnats, you got, you got dead animals laying everywhere, and then you get festering boils all over your body. I mean, were the flies still around to get in there too? I mean, was everybody walking around oozing? I don't think it's wrong to, to like try to put yourself there when you're reading scripture. I think it's important to do that, to understand the magnitude of what was happening here. That was a disgusting thing. The plague of boils followed, was followed by the plague of hail, which stripped every stock and every tree in the entire nation of Israel. Israel or I'm sorry, the nation of Egypt. The only area that it didn't touch was the land of Goshen, where the Israelites were. That's where they were living. Their trees, their stalks, any fields they had were fine. The eighth plague was, on the, was the plague of locusts. The locusts came and they devoured every last green thing in the land. Everything the hail hadn't destroyed, the locusts did. And they were everywhere. They cut, it says it covered the floors of their homes. I'm not a bug guy. I gotta tell you, I'm not a bug guy. And my sister could be watching today and she would be mad at me if I didn't tell you this story. But one time, I, I, I really don't like June bugs. I, they land on you, they you know, stick to you, and then they crawl under your, your clothes. And You know how they sound really low too? You know, I don't like the buzzing. I mean, I'll run like a nine-year-old girl if a June bug's coming at me. I, some of you have witnessed that, I'm sorry. One time my sister and I were outside and it was getting kind of late and we were just, I think, playing basketball or something out in, the, out in the driveway when we were kids. And all of a sudden we looked up and there's all these June bugs all over the garage door. And we had to go through that. It was open and so it was all over around in there. And so she ran through them and just got inside and didn't make a big deal about it. And I'm just like, okay, my little sister just did it. I can do it. But I didn't want to. And so I ran, and we didn't, have, we didn't have those fancy buttons that the garage door closes and opens. We, we had a rope. You pulled it, and the garage door came down, right? So I ran in there, and I was going to grab that rope, pull down that door, and let, let the June bugs behind me and put that barrier between us, you know? And I ran, and I ran so fast and so hard that I grabbed the rope, and my feet went out from underneath me. I landed flat on my back, just boom, as the June bugs were like zzz. I don't like bugs. There was a lot of locusts, okay? A lot of locusts, like grasshoppery things, or maybe they were, I don't know, what, what is a locust in the Bible? Grasshopper, or, or are they like cicadas? I don't like cicadas either. There's a couple years ago, a few years ago, all those cicadas were out, you remember that? Man, I went out and I was trying to use my weed eater and they thought that that was like the queen cicada and they're all like attacking it, just because it's buzzing. Anybody, anybody feel that? That was horrible. It's like my, in my worst nightmares. Eww. I just can't imagine it. The ninth plague was the plague of darkness. It became pitch black in the land of Egypt. No light for three days. It was so dark that people couldn't leave their homes. They couldn't see anyone. It was lonely. It was scary. Would light ever return? And the only thing I can, I can compare this to, because it was pitch black, is when we've, I've been into caves, and a lot of you have, have toured caves before, and they'll shut the lights off for a second just to show you how dark it is. I've done, you can do the same thing in this basement, by the way. <laughs> done that too. But it's just pitch black, your eyes never adjust. That's how it was for them. And while this was happening to the Egyptians, the Israelites could see just fine. And time and time again, after each one of those plagues befell upon the Egyptians, the Bible says that Pharaoh just kept refusing to submit. He wouldn't let go of the bondage he held these Israelites in. He hardened his heart, and God hardened his heart, which that's a whole other subject that we could get into, but not this morning. His heart was hard and he wouldn't give in. The final plague that fell upon Egypt was the plague on the firstborn. Exodus 11, four through five. Moses had announced to Pharaoh, this is what the Lord says, at midnight tonight, I will pass through the heart of Egypt. 
All the firstborn sons will die in every family in Egypt, from the oldest son of Pharaoh who sits on his throne to the oldest son of his lowliest servant girl who grinds the flour. Even the firstborn of all the livestock will die. And understand, there were, if they had any livestock left after the other plague on them, these ones were going to die this time. Why did I just go through all those plagues? What's the, what's the purpose? I mean, we're, we're in a series called The Power of the Blood of Jesus. There's power in the blood of Jesus. And today I'm talking about power to deliver, okay? And I want you to start connecting these things. I don't have any big, huge revelation for you today. I don't need one. I just need you to get a hold of this simple truth today. There's power in the blood of Jesus to deliver. How does this relate to us today, all these plagues? The Israelites were enslaved. Pharaoh would not let them go. Even with all the horror and all the destruction of the first nine plagues, Pharaoh still would not let them go. And there is no one in this room today that is a literal slave. We live in a free society. We are not enslaved or in bondage to another nation, at least not like the Egyptians. And not as of this moment are we enslaved to anybody. We're still free. And that could always change depending on decisions made by our elected officials. I get that. But spiritually speaking, if we're honest, we have all been, at least at some point in our lives, enslaved to something, in bondage to something. And that slavery or bondage comes in many forms. It could be in the form of a sin that holds you in bondage. You've tried to free yourself from it, but it just seems to have this stubborn hold on you like Pharaoh had on the Egyptians. There's a picture here. All of those plagues, and he still wouldn't let go. All of that effort to get out from underneath being enslaved to that sin, possibly, in this example, and it just still holds on. Your Egypt or your bondage just seems to have this grip. And I know some of you are, are thinking in your mind, what am I in bondage to? It may not be sin. It could be sin, but it may not be. If it's sin, it could be some sin that's become habitual in your life. That sin that you've found yourself living in, it's like a prison, it's bondage, it just doesn't let go. Your Egypt could be an emotional issue that doesn't seem to let go of its hold on you. It could be a diagnosed medical condition regarding your mental health, or maybe it's something that's not diagnosable. But the fact is, it has become an Egypt to you, and it's so stubborn, it just won't release you, no matter how hard you've tried. It may be in the form of depression or bipolar disorder or anxiety or even just continually struggling with low self-esteem. I can't name everything. These are real life issues though that aren't always the result of something you've done. And I think sometimes we do that as a church. We say, well, if you're experiencing that, then it's something you've done. And we put shame on somebody for that. Could be, but a lot of times it's not. Living with these kinds of bondages, oftentimes, it's, it's just like being enslaved in a maximum security prison. There doesn't seem to be any way out and you're stuck in that bondage without hope. It feels like a 100 years and all you have ever known is this bondage. It's been so long since you've tasted freedom. Do you see the correlation with the Israelites? It could be an addiction, something that has a grip on you to such a degree that it controls you. That addiction has taken over in spite of your efforts to overcome it, and it has dictated your life to you and taken you to places you never thought you'd end up. Gambling, sex addictions of any kind, addictions to alcohol or drugs, addictions to food, many of these types of addictions overlap with what I said about being in bondage to sins, but they're all sorts of addictions. It could be an unforgiveness or a bitter root within your heart that is the result of what someone else has done to you. That could be your Egypt 
the bondage that tries to hold you. And you just can't seem to free yourself from the Egypt it has become in your life. Someone's abused you. Someone's mistreated you. Someone's hurt. Someone hurt someone you loved or love and mistreated them and you've get gotten this unforgiveness towards them. Man, I, and I, I can understand that. I can relate to that. Somebody hurt my grandkids. Oh man, that'd be hard. But it happens. And we get in bondage to these things. Those hurts, those offenses, could have been someone in, a, in church, could have been church leadership that did that. And they become bondages in your life. Maybe you are so broken over what has transpired in your family that the sorrow of it has become a bondage to you. You just can't get out from underneath the sorrow. Maybe grief itself, which is normal and a, and a thing that we have to go through when we lose, uh, when we have a, a, a loss, whether it's a loved one or, or something else. Grief is a real thing that we must go through, but it can become a bondage if we live there forever. Doesn't mean you don't have the right to grieve. But when it becomes a bondage, you understand what I'm saying, right? I can't possibly speak to every kind of bondage, every kind of issue that there is, but this one thing I do know, the blood of the lamb has the power to deliver us from every kind of slavery there is. The blood of Jesus, our perfect spotless lamb, has the power to deliver us to deliver us. Last week I briefly mentioned the first Passover lamb and the sacrifice that the Israelites engaged in while they were still in Egypt. And in Exodus we see the final plague that fell on the firstborn of Egypt and it takes all of Exodus 11 to cover it. But then chapter 12 is all about God instituting that first Passover. So I, I wanna read it a little bit and I'm gonna read a, a little more scripture than I normally would but hang with me because this is all important. Exodus 12, one through 10. While the Israelites were still in the land of Egypt, the Lord gave the following instructions to Moses and Aaron. From now on, this month will be the first month of the year for you. Understand what's happening here. The ninth plague has already happened. The 10th plague is, is coming, but Moses and Aaron are given instructions by God and he's telling the Israelite people. He said, from now on, this month will be the first month of the year for you. That's significant. God reset their calendars is what he did. Starting now, this month will be the first month of the year. It's a whole new beginning, a fresh, clean slate. It's like New Year's Day, right? How many feel that? New Year's Day, it's like a, a new day to start over again. We, we kind of make our resolutions and things. But, but that's kind of, I, I, I imagine that's how they felt. This is the, this is, this is, this is a new, this is our first month. It's a new year. Right now, this is the first month of the year. Verse three, announce to the whole community of Israel that on the 10th day of this month, each family must choose a lamb or a young goat for a sacrifice, one animal for each household. If a family is too small to eat a whole animal, let him share with another family in the neighborhood. Divide the animal according to the size of each family, family and how much they can eat. The animal you select must be a one-year-old male, either a sheep or a goat, with no defects. Take special care of this chosen animal until the evening of the 14th day of this first month. So this lamb had to be spotless, right? Without blemish. It was taken into the home on the 10th day of the first month, the new first month, which she just instituted, until the 14th day. 14th day. And can you, can you imagine how the kids would have loved this? Oh, it's time to bring the Passover lamb into the house. We have this lamb here. How many know that that thing became a pet pretty darn quick? They must have developed somewhat of a relationship with this perfect spotless lamb. I think it's significant that there was four days in there. Then the whole assembly of the community of Israel must slaughter their lamb or young goat at twilight. Okay, so you bring this lovely little creature, this perfect spotless lamb into your home, everybody gets attached to it, and then you kill it. 
Verse 7, they are to take some of the blood and smear it on the sides and the top of the door frames of the houses where they, where they eat the animal. That same night, they must roast the meat over a fire and eat it along with bitter salad greens and bread without, made without yeast. Verse 9, do not eat any of the meat raw or boiled in water. The whole animal, including the head, legs, and internal organs, must be roasted over a fire. Do not leave any of it until the next morning. Burn whatever is not eaten before morning. The next verses instruct the Israelites to make sure that they are fully dressed when they eat it, wearing their sandals and even carrying their walking sticks in their hands while they ate it. And it says you have to eat this thing with urgency. You have to eat it in haste. Why would God instruct them to be fully dressed? It was so that they would be ready to leave when Pharaoh finally gave up. It's a picture of readiness. I got my shoes on. I got my cloak on. I got my walking stick. And when This plague befalls on Egypt. They're not just going to let you go. They are going to beg you to leave. They had to be ready. In church, there's many other details that they were to follow in reference to the Passover meal, which I don't have time today to cover, but I encourage you all to read it in Exodus 12, especially as we approach the celebration of Easter. And honestly, you're going to get a picture of that in our Good Friday service. If you haven't got a ticket yet, because I don't know if I, if I have anybody to invite. I don't know anybody. Let me tell you something. Buy the darn ticket. Get your reservations made. You, your, your spouse, buy an extra one or two, and then go find somebody to invite. Well, what if I don't get to invite anybody? You pay 10 bucks, 20 bucks for two tickets, you're probably going to invite somebody. Right? Do it in faith. Why? Why, why is it so important? This is an opportunity that we have. And that first station, when we go into the upper room, that's what's in the fireside room there, they're gonna deck that thing out like like it was the upper room where Jesus had the Last Supper. And it's a Seder meal that's gonna be done. And we have, uh, uh, is it Nicholas? Nicodemus. Nicodemus, Jory Hunderdoss, is gonna be serving that Seder meal and explaining those intricate details. It's gonna be fantastic. You do not wanna miss it. And I I dare say this, that you will never take communion again the same way when you hear all of that and see all the symbolic things going on with even just the Seder meal. Exodus 12, 12 through 13. On that night, this is what he's telling Moses and Aaron on that night, I will, after he institutes the Passover, he says, I, I will pass through the land of Egypt and strike down every firstborn son and firstborn male animal in the land of Egypt. I will execute judgment against all the gods of Egypt, for I am the Lord. But the blood on your doorposts will serve as a sign, marking the houses where you are staying. When I see the blood, I will pass over you. This plague of death will not touch you when I strike the land of Egypt." So the blood of this perfect lamb was shed, bring it into the home, get a relationship, and then slaughter this little guy. Take the blood, put it on the doorpost, and the Lord won't, will pass over that house and not let this plague of the death of the firstborn male befall upon that home. It, the blood was shed, then the blood was applied on the sides and the top of the door frames of their home. And then, that, that's what they did, and then this 10th plague happens in Exodus 12, 29, 30. And that night at midnight, the Lord struck down all the firstborn sons in the land of Egypt, from the firstborn son of Pharaoh, who sat on his throne, to the firstborn son of the prisoner in the dungeon. Every, even the firstborn of their livestock were killed. Pharaoh and all of his officials and all the people of Egypt woke up during the night, and loud wailing was heard throughout the land of Egypt. There was not a single house where someone had not died. Can you imagine the outcry? The wailing. I mean, it could have been babies. It could have been old people. I mean, people's husbands who were the firstborn son. We're not just talking kids here. Every firstborn son died. And everything transpired just, just as, as Moses said to Pharaoh. And finally, Pharaoh conceded. In, in Exodus 12, 
31 through 33, Pharaoh sent for Moses and Aaron during the night. Get out, he ordered. (laughs) Not, you can go. He said, get out. He ordered them to leave my people and take the rest of the Israelites with you. Go and worship the Lord as you have requested. Take your flocks and herds as you said and be gone. Go, but bless me as you leave. All the Egyptians urged the people of Israel to get out of the land as quickly as possible, for they thought, we will all die if they stay here any longer. Hence, have your stick, have your sandals, have your cloak, right? Be ready when you eat this Passover lamb. Egypt represents bondage, and Pharaoh represents the stubborn hold that that bondage has. The first nine plagues didn't cause him to budge in his stubbornness, but the death of every firstborn male in Egypt, it pushed him to his limits. You have to see this today. The applied blood of that pure, spotless lamb delivered the Israelites from the plague of the death of the firstborn. It delivered them from that plague. And it wasn't enough to just sacrifice the lamb. They had to take its blood and apply it to the doorposts. It's not enough, church, for for us to just accept the fact that Jesus died on the cross for us. We have to take that blood and apply it into our lives, the doorposts into our hearts. There's doctrine out there that says, well, you know, Jesus died for all the sin of the world, so I'm okay. Everybody's going to be okay. God is love, and, and, and because God is love, there's no bad thing that can ever happen to us. It's crazy stuff to think that people would believe that. It doesn't even really make sense. The blood must be applied. Do you see that? Are you with me today? The applied blood delivered them from their firstborn sons dying and ultimately rattled Pharaoh enough that he not only allowed them to leave Egypt, he couldn't get rid of them quick enough at this point. And consider this, they wouldn't have been able to leave if all of their firstborn sons had died, because they would have been in grief right along with the Egyptians. They were delivered because of the blood that was applied. The blood of the lamb delivered them, and the Israelites commemorated this pass, passing over with a festival that they have celebrated from that day until now. And since approximately 1440 B.C. until 2022 A.D., that's nearly 3,500 years that they've been celebrating this Passover feast. Fast forward from this first Passover to the time of Jesus, which was approximately 1,470 years later, Jesus lived a pure, sinless life and was put to death in the first month of the Jewish calendar. Trace it back, and he was crucified on Passover. He became our once and for all Passover lamb. And just as the blood of that pure spotless lamb was shed and and then applied to the doorposts of their homes and brought about deliverance for those ancient Israelites, our Passover lamb, Jesus Christ, the one who was sacrificed on the altar of the cross, has delivered us from our personal Egypts. His shed blood has the power to deliver. We just talked about bondages, bondages that we all have experienced, maybe some of them in the past, maybe some of them right now. But I'm here to tell you today, I'm here to encourage you that the shed blood of Jesus that delivered them way back then can deliver you today. From whatever bondage you're in, whatever thing is weighing on you, whether it's sin, whether it's some kind of emotional scarring, whether it's wh- whatever it might be, some kind of pain, some kind of offense that was done to you that you just can't let go of, some kind of unforgiveness, some kind of bitterness, I don't know what it is, but the blood of Jesus Christ that was shed upon the cross has the power to deliver you from that. And you don't have to live under it anymore. You see, I think the church sometimes doesn't do things like outreach as a whole, big C church. Oh, we don't do outreach. We just get together and we have our holy huddles, right? Part of the reason for that is the church is so in bondage themselves because they haven't applied the blood of Jesus like they should and not live underneath those bondages. And don't get me wrong, I'm not trying to put shame on you if you live under a bondage. I'm just trying to tell you, you don't have to live there. I've been there too. I'm like, what in the world am I doing? I wake up, I'm like, why am I living under this? Enough's enough, I'm done. I'm applying the blood and I'm walking away from that. 
I'm not going to let that control me and dictate my life any longer. Say, well, it's easier said than done. Maybe so. But I believe the word of God. The shed blood of Jesus has the power to deliver. He is our one, once and for all, Passover lamb. Deliverance is the action of being rescued. Thank you, God, for rescuing us from the bondages that we get ourselves into, from the entanglements that we find ourselves in. Thank you for rescuing us, for delivering us. It means to be liberated, released, ransomed, emancipated, redeemed. It means to be set free. Colossians 1, 13 through 14 says this, for he has rescued us from the kingdom of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of his dear son who purchased our freedom and forgave our sins. He has purchased with his own blood our freedom and we don't have to be in bondage. There isn't anyone in this room who enjoys being enslaved. And again, we can be enslaved to so many different things, but, but, but the simple message today about the power of the blood of Jesus is that he shed his blood so you and I would, wouldn't have to live in bondage any longer. We can be free. There's freedom in Christ, and he whom the Son sets free is free indeed. We gotta apply the shed blood of Jesus to our lives, just like they had to. They applied it to the doorpost, we apply it to the doorpost of our heart. We plead it. I mentioned this last week a little bit, and you can get into a real theology of what it means to plead blood, and some of it gets goofy, and some of it doesn't. This is pleading the blood. Are you innocent, or are you guilty, you know, in a court of law? And so you, you, you make your plea, right? You plea. Here's my plea. How do you plead? I plead guilty, I plead innocent. Well, this is because we're Christians, because we've accepted Jesus and his gift on the cross to us. Our plea is this, how do you plead? I'm a blood-bought chosen, or child of the living God. The blood has covered me. It's purchased me. I can plead the blood. I don't ever want to be held again by the chains of Egypt. And it's so funny when you follow the story of the Israelites through the desert, and how many times do they say, oh, we should have just stayed in Egypt. We at least had food. Moses, you brought us out here to die. Oh, if we could just go back to Egypt. And don't we do the same thing? We ah, just want to go back to that same old sin. It was comfortable there. It felt good there. I had my posse with me there. The devil didn't mess, me, mess with me as much when I was there, is what we think, but he was messing with us all the more. He'll lead us from our Egypts into the promised land, and we may have to still endure some deserts. There, there'll be troubled times, and we have to cross some seas, and we may have to trust the Lord for our daily bread and provisions, but we can be free, church. Never again held by the chains of Egypt no matter how stubborn Pharaoh is. And I know how hard some of those bondages, how gripping they are on some people. We get saved, we get delivered in that moment we feel and we're excited and then, and then that thing just kind of just, it's got its claws in you. Look at what it took for Pharaoh to release blood. It's funny, too, because Jesus was the firstborn son of God. In his life, he laid down willingly, just like the lamb was sacrificed during Passover so that would pass over the people. Jesus laid his life down so we would be passed over today. When God sees us, he sees the blood. He doesn't see all of our indiscretions. I thank him for that. There are no shackles 
that match the power. There are no chains that match the power of the shed blood of Jesus. And its power to completely deliver us from Egypt. The day he was crucified, it was Passover in Jerusalem. I made mention of that. Just a quick estimate based off the number of Jewish families living in the area at that time. It could be supposed that there were at least 250,000 lambs sacrificed that day that Jesus died on the cross. That's enough blood volume or volume of blood to fill this room. We figured it out. We did the math to fill this room five feet high with blood. But here's the deal. We have a once and for all Passover lamb. And because of his shed blood, death will never truly touch us. Sure, this body wears out, I get that. But to die here is only to be born into eternal life. True death is separation from God, and we will never have to be separated from him. We experience him now, and we love it, but but we got so much more to look forward to. He has truly delivered us in this way from death itself, but that same power that can deliver us from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light, from the kingdom of, of hell to the kingdom of heaven, can deliver you from any Egypt with any pharaoh hold that could ever be on you, no matter what it is. We just have to apply the blood this morning and then walk in his freedom. And if that thing rears its ugly head again, You just say, Lord, I need to get back underneath your blood. I need to apply the blood of Jesus Christ. I need to plead that I am a blood-bought child of a living God. I have been purchased. Christ purchased my freedom with that blood. So whatever that bondage is, it's okay to speak to it. Get off me. I don't know what that bondage is. But you know, again, it could be anything. Some people, it's their spending habits. And is it really sin? maybe eventually you could get that way, but maybe not. Maybe it's just selfishness. I guess that's sin. You're like, I'm sick of being in bondage to how money just goes through my pockets. Anybody ever felt that way? <laughs> he can deliver you from that. He can deliver you from the, 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 the worst vile sin you can think of that has a grip on you. He can deliver you from that. The blood of Jesus has the power to deliver. And again, like I said, if it comes back and it gets its claws in you once again, what do you do? You put your foot down and say, no more. And then tomorrow when it tries to raise its ugly head again and try to prove to you that you're still in bondage, you put your foot down and you say, no more. You do that enough and he'll leave you alone. I want to pray today. I'm not going to turn on any music or anything like that. But would you bow your heads and close your eyes? And I really mean it. Close your eyes. I'm just going to ask a simple question. Is there something, whether it's sin or not sin, whether it's emotional, whether, whatever it might be, that's holding you hostage? It's put you in bondage. You feel like it's controlling you and you're sick of it. If that's you, would you just raise your hand real quick? Maybe it just fills your thought life all the time and you can't seem to stop thinking about it and you just want to be done with it. Maybe you dream about this stupid thing and it never seems to go away. Hands all over the place. I want to tell you today, the shed blood of Jesus has purchased you and it's purchased your freedom from that thing, from that Egypt, from that Pharaoh's hold on you. Lord God, you saw every hand that was raised here today. You know, because you love us with an everlasting love, what we struggle with. And God, you sympathize with us. You hurt for us. You feel for us. But God, I also think sometimes you're like, come on, guys. I've already done everything I need to do. Just walk in it. Lord, reveal to us today the delivering power that's in your shed blood. Jesus, 
We plead the blood right now, your blood over our lives. We are blood bought. We've been purchased with the most precious price. And we're gonna walk in victory. We lay anxiety down, we lay depression down, we lay unforgiveness down, we lay bitterness down, we lay every addiction that, that's known to man, we lay that at your feet today, God. We lay those hurts, those offenses, those emotional struggles, all those things, we lay them down at the foot of your cross. And we thank you, God, for delivering us from those. We don't have to be in bondage anymore, and we declare that we are free because your word, sa word says, he whom the sun sets free is free indeed. We either believe your word or we don't, and today, God, we declare with our own mouths that we believe it. We will walk in victory. Not because of how good we are or because of anything we've done, but because your shed blood has delivered us. God, I thank you for every person in this room. I thank you, God, that when you were on that cross, that we were on your mind. When they shoved that crown of thorns in your head, when they continued to whip you and tear your flesh Turning, turning it into ribbons, God, that we were on your mind. Our struggles, our sin, our hurts, our offenses, our pain, our addictions, they were all on your mind, and you willingly kept walking towards Calvary. And even God, when, or Jesus, when they nailed you to the cross, we were on your mind. You were purchasing us with every drop of spilt blood through that whole process. You were purchasing our deliverance. And God, or Jesus, when you said, it is finished, it was finished. The work had been accomplished. And this is not a statement at all to put shame on anybody, but who do we think we are if we don't walk in the freedom that he paid such a high price for? We love you, Jesus. And we thank you today that we are free. We are free. Let that Egypt in your life just melt away as you just dwell on the fact that he has made you free. God bless you today. Thanks for being a part of the Indianola First podcast. Join us next week to stay updated on our latest messages.